This is going to be an overview of the Gospel of John. Now, the author is John the Apostle. Not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle. And John also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. This gospel has 879 verses, 18,658 words, and 21 chapters. And Jesus Christ is shown as the eternal Son of God. You see, in each one of these Gospels, we've talked about how Jesus Christ is portrayed in a different way. In this one, he's shown as the eternal Son of God. An interesting fact about this Gospel is that when John writes it, he has the rest of the Bible also available for him to read. He even had all of Paul's epistles, so he would have been familiar with church-age doctrine. And in the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit gives a genealogy that goes back to the beginning, and that's it, because he's being shown as the Son of God. The fact that he's always been here and always will be, he had no beginning. He was here in the beginning. He was here to make everything that you see. This gospel was written between A.D. 88 and A.D. 90. And you got seven I am's. And here's a list of the seven I am's that Jesus says. You've got Jesus saying, I am the bread of life in chapter 6 and verse 35. You got Jesus saying, I am the light of the world in 8, 12 and 9 and verse 5. You got Jesus saying, I am the door, in chapter 10 and verse 7. You have the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I am the good shepherd, in chapter 10 and verse 11. You got him saying, the re he's the resurrection and the life, in chapter 11 and verse 25. You have him saying, I am the true vine, in chapter 15 and verse 1. And my favorite one, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in chapter 19 and verse 6. You've, all, you've got seven great miracles that when you put them together, it's a picture of our salvation. Seven great miracles. He turns the water into wine. He gives you a different kind of water. He talks about in Ephesians, the washing of water by the word. And getting saved is as simple as taking a drink of that water. Jesus turns the water into wine. It's as simple as taking a drink of water. You have him healing the nobleman's son. And it, that's an illustration of it's by faith alone. Then you have the paralyzed man that couldn't make it to the pool. That's a picture of how it's not of works. And then after salvation, you got the feeding of the 5,000 would represent something after your salvation, showing you you got responsibility to feed others. You have the calming of the storm. When the Lord calmed the storm, that's the peace of God which passeth all understanding that you get after you get peace with God. Then you got the healing of the blind man. You have your eyes opened and you have discernment. You got the raising of Lazarus. That can picture your new life and also the rapture that you're going to be a part of when he says your name and you come forth. Now, historically, John presents Jesus as the Son of God, his life, his ministry, and his death on the cross. Doctrinally, you discover the doctrine of God manifested in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh, according to 1 Timothy 3.16 and according to the Gospel of John. Devotionally, when you're looking at this book devotionally, you see God chose to be my personal Savior, and I need, I need to choose Him to be my personal Savior. He chose me. I'm going to choose Him. The thing is, God wants everybody to be saved. It's God's will for every person to be saved. God chose that He would be everybody's personal Savior who would come to Him and believe. You just have to choose him back. So God chose me 
to be my personal Savior. And I'm going to choose him back to be my personal Savior. And if I don't choose him, then I, I, I go to hell for eternity. But I chose him, so I get to be with the Lord for eternity. Now, let's get into the book, chapter 1. In this chapter, you see, in the beginning was the Word. Jesus Christ is the Word. And it says, the Word became flesh. Jesus Christ left heaven and became flesh. The Son of God came down in the flesh. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word wasn't only with God, but He is God. John 1, 2, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus Christ didn't just begin existing in a manger one day. He has always been here and always will be. He said before Abraham was, I am. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Constantly saying, I am. Because that's what the Lord said his name was back in Exodus he tells Moses to tell him, tell him that I am sent you. John 1, 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So in him is life, and outside of him is death. He is so much life that death couldn't even hold him down when he died for you and for me. John 1, 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 1.10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So he came down. For our sakes, he became poor. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He came into his own, and his own received him not. The creator of the universe walked around in his creation, and they didn't even know him. I mean, it's like the boss going undercover at your workplace, and the em employees didn't know he was the boss, and he's seeing everything that they're doing, and they have no idea who he is. But the difference is that Jesus Christ wasn't undercover. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Plainly showing them uh, who he was. It's crazy if, if that happened at your workplace that you wouldn't know who your boss was. It's crazy that they didn't know and couldn't tell that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Is God manifested in the flesh. John 1, 11 through 12, he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So through him I can become the son of God. Not everybody is a child of God. If you're not saved, then you're actually a child of the devil. To be a son of God, you've got to come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe on him. John 1, 14, and the word of God, and the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, they idolize these athletes and call them gods, or they say, here's proof that Kobe Bryant was not human, and they explain how great he was on the basketball court. But there was a day when the God of gods came down and dwelt among us. He was crucified. They didn't idolize him like they do these athletes today. And he was much greater. He was their creator. John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ takes you further than the law. The law only lets you know you're a sinner, but it can't get rid of your sin. Jesus Christ kept the law, offered himself on the cross, and gives you a way out of your sin debt. In chapter 1, John is sent to bear witness of this light that we've been talking about. In John 1, 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. If you're a Christian listening to me right now, you may not think you can do much, but you can be a voice. You can be one that is sent to bear witness of that light, that light that came into you when you believed the gospel. And this book will shine the light on people. And it shines the light on their sin and exposes them. But in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In John chapter 2, Jesus turns the water into wine, his first miracle. And you'll see that he also cleanses the temple. 
in John two fourteen through 16. It says, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. This gives you a look at the Savior that people don't want to see, that they don't want to admit. They want him to be okay with everything and everybody, but he's not okay with everything and everybody. Jesus Christ came in with a whip. He made a scourge of small cords, and he beat the devil out of some people in there, and he overthrew the tables. He said, don't make my father's house an house of merchandise. And, you know, he said he called it a den of thieves. That is what he thinks of all these people making millions of dollars off the gospel and taking all these old ladies' money and making you feel guilty for not giving all of your income to them when Paul tells you that you need to provide for your own. He said, if any man provide not for his own, he's denied the faith, is worse than an infidel. And yet you got there's some of these preachers making you think you got to provide for them so that they can buy a brand new billion dollar house and a jet and everything else. That makes God sick. I mean, I make God sick sometimes. Sometimes I need him to overthrow some tables in me and show me how to act in his temple. Because you see, today in the New Testament, in the church age, 1 Corinthians 6 if you read 1 Corinthians 6, it'll tell you your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you need the Lord to, you need to read the Bible and let the Lord overthrow some tables in you and show you where you are making God sick. Because your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. You don't want to defile the temple. If you're saved, your body's the temple. Chapter 3, Jesus talks to Nicodemus about being born again. And I personally do believe being born again is something that happens to you when you believe on Jesus Christ. Paul said he was as one born out of due time in 1 Corinthians 15, 8. In Galatians chapter 4, he speaks of those that are born after the Spirit. In Galatians 4, 29, he says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. He said, even so it is now, during our day, mine and your day. We are born after the Spirit when we're saved. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul talks about how he begot some people through the gospel. So, they were begotten through the gospel. Being born again is definitely something associated with your salvation and not just the nation of Israel. That's what regeneration is. Your regeneration, you've been born again if you're saved. But John says in John 3, 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When Moses put that serpent on a pole back there in the book of Numbers, the people looked at it and they lived. That pictures Jesus Christ who became our serpent on a pole. When I put my trust on him, then I was made alive. He became sin for me on the cross. He became sin. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ became my serpent on a pole, and a serpent is sin personified. All my sin was on him. All your sin was on him. The sin of the whole world was on him. And when you look to him, when you believe on him to be your Savior, you are healed. John 3, 15, That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God is a whosoever God. Any man who puts their faith on him gets eternal life. His blood will cleanse anybody of their sin. John three sixteen and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came to save. And if you don't get in now, then there is a day when you'll see him coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance. You see, right now, the Lord Jesus Christ has his hand outstretched towards you as your Savior. 
but soon he is coming back with his hand stretched out as a slayer. And you don't want to be on the receiving end of that. You need to get saved today. Because John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you haven't ever came to Jesus Christ to believe on him as your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, then you are already you already have the wrath of God presently on you. The wrath of God is breathing on your neck. And the only way to get that wrath off is to come to Jesus Christ. Right now, if you have not believed the gospel, then the only thing that's keeping you from falling into hell right now is the fact that God is letting your heart keep beating. If God were to just let your heart stop beating, maybe you got in a car wreck, maybe you just die of a heart attack, you would open your eyes in torments in a place called hell and you would burn for eternity. The wrath of God is presently abiding on you. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Chapter 4, you got Jesus and the woman at the well. He tells her about that living water. Later on in the chapter, he heals a, the, a certain nobleman's son. In John 4, 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said unto her, the woman at the well, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You see, accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is as simple as taking a sip of water. Come to him right now. Tell him you're going to believe on him to pay your sin debt. He died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you, for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. You come to him, call on him, tell him you're going to believe that to pay for your sin. It's as simple as taking a drink of water. You can get eternal life. He is the water of life. To stay, of li to stay alive, you got to have water. To get eternal life, you got to drink of the living water. Chapter 5, Jesus heals a man who couldn't get into the pool. And that pictures, you can't, get, you can't get there by works. Jesus has to do it for you. So the Jews want to kill Jesus Christ because he heals a man on the Sabbath day. In John 5, 16, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Religious people don't care about the souls of man. All they want to do is defend their beliefs. That's all they care about. They also want to kill him for making himself equal with God. In John 5, 18, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. One time, well, not one time, but several times, I've tried to explain the deity of Christ to somebody else and they look at me like I'm stupid and they say, no, no, he's not God. They say, no, Jesus is not God. He's just his son. But by saying that Jesus is the son of God, you're making himself equal. You're making him equal with God. He's, Jesus Christ is not just his one and only son, as the new versions say. He's the, be on, he's the only begotten son. He's a different kind of son than me and you. Philippians 2, 5, and 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The, the new versions change that. They say he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But here it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ knew he was God manifest in the flesh. In John 6, you got the feeding of the 5,000. John 6, 5 through 6, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. You see, it says, And this he said to prove him. Jesus said this to prove him. He asked this question. This is something the Lord does with people. He asked them a question, even though he already knows the answer. Just like he said to Adam back there in the garden, after Adam sinned, he said, Where art thou? The Lord knew exactly where Adam was. 
Any question the Lord asks, he already knows the answer. He does things to prove you and to test you. He puts you in situations even though he already knows what you're going to do. Just like when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, he stopped Abraham and said, Now I know that thou fearest God. The Lord knew that already. You know, he, he gets down on our level to test us and prove us. The Lord has you go through stuff even though he already knows what the outcome's going to be of you going through it. The Lord knows he is the only one who can see the future. And he knows that he's the one that knows all things and we can't see the future and don't know all things. So if he operated like that we already knew, like he did, and if he operated by just not doing anything to prove or test anyone, since he already knows the outcome, then nobody would ever grow. There would never be any illustrations or examples or anything for us to follow or get inspired by if he never put us through a test or a trial. How could there be any illustrations or examples of, for people? In John 6, 8 through 13, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves, loaves and two f small fishes but what are they among so many and jesus said make the men sit down now there was much grass in the place so the men sat down in number about five thousand that's a bunch of people and jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would when they were filled he said unto his disciples Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. So Jesus filled the 5,000 with five barley loaves and two small fishes. And then they had, had to gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. And it says, Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So there was some left over. The Lord could multiply all the food in the world and drop it down from heaven for every starving person in the world right now. But he doesn't. That's because it's a sin-cursed world. People have to go through things. Why did I why did I not be born in that in that country and be starving to death? Why couldn't that person that's starving over there be born here where I'm born? And be able to have food every day. God knows best. That's the way he saw it. He's putting those people through that for a reason. He's not having me go through it for a reason. But God can fix any situation that you're in. He has the power to do it. He has the power to just let you keep going through it to make you better. He has the power. But sometimes him using his power to change what you're going through isn't what's best. John six nineteen through 21. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received into him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. You see, you see guys like Chris Angel Mind Freak who want to copy the miracles of Jesus walking on water, but it's all fake. It's all a show. They can't even fake it good. Jesus did the real thing. He walked on the water. Only Jesus can do that, or those he gives the power to do it. Notice that they willingly received him into the ship. And this is what he wants us to do, willingly receive him. Why else would he make, why would he make good and evil choices? He wants you to willingly receive him. When Jesus got in the ship, it immediately went to the land. This is, a, this is an even greater miracle than him walking on the water because he just teleported himself and whole objects and other people to the land. In John six fifty eight, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. The manna in the Old Testament is definitely a picture of the real bread from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. In John six sixty four through 66, it says, But there are some of you that believe not. There may be somebody listening right now that doesn't believe. But it says, For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, 
and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now notice the context is about men betraying him, about men going back. And notice that the verse number is John 6, 6, 6. There is something to that because that is the number of the beast. John 6, 6, 6. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter is always chiming in. Sometimes he is right on the money, and sometimes he's way off. Here he is right on. He said, They're sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So Judas was a devil before the devil enters into him. Notice that Judas is mentioned right after the 666 verse as the person that would betray him. Judas is a strange character, definitely at the very least a type of the Antichrist, and that's at the very least. A part of Judas most likely goes into the Antichrist. Both of them are called the son of perdition. In John chapter 7, the Jews wonder how Jesus knew so much, having never learned. You see, the religious people will see you and they'll be like, how does he know so much? He doesn't have the right religion, yet he knows so much. And he has standards. And most times you'll have more and higher standards than those lost religious people. And it offends them and convicts them. In John seven nineteen through 20, it says, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? You see, they were supposed to be all about the law, yet none of them kept the law, and they wanted to kill Jesus. Many times the people today who think they're earning their way to heaven will look at somebody like you who believes in eternal security, you believe in once saved, always saved, and they think they're better than you, yet you have more standards than they got. And you're like, you're supposed to be keeping the law to earn your way to heaven, and I'm over here, I know the law can't get me to heaven. Yet I'm keeping the commandments of God, and you don't keep the commandments of God. And yet you hate me for that. Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to, who goeth about to kill thee. Notice that the lost religious people like to accuse the people with pure religion of being devil-possessed. They called Paul a heretic. They called Elijah the troubler of Israel. You trouble them because you... Preach Jesus Christ crucified, and the only way you can get to heaven is through him. And yet you got better standards than they got, even though they want to go around saying, well, you believe in that eternal security. You believe a person can just get saved and do whatever he wants to do. That's all they got is stupid arguments like that. John seven twenty four: judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You see, man is about that outward appearance. He's about that outward evidence of things. But God sees the heart. Man can't see the heart. So he will always have the temptation on looking at something outwardly. We have the temptation of that. We want to see it outwardly. Uh, men want an outward display of religion. Like the Pharisees, they wanted to see the clothes. They liked to walk around in long robes. They liked the, the long prayers. And men want an outward display of that religion. They want to see statues and things like that in your, in your yard that you would bow down to or something. They, they want to see everything outwardly. They want an outward display in your clothes. They want an outward display of emotion or works to prove that you are right with God on the inside. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't live for God and do works. Obviously, I believe that. But religious people are more about what's going on outside than they are on the inside. And I don't automatically assume a man isn't a good Bible preacher or teacher just because of the clothes he's wearing. You know, I, I seen a guy out preaching on the street one time that had just a old rugged-looking pair of overalls on and, and met dirty shoes, and he was holding up a Bible. I mean, 
you can't just look at somebody by their clothes just because this man had didn't have nice clothes to wear didn't mean he wasn't a good bible preacher or teacher why would you look at him and say why is he out here in those raggedy old clothes preaching he should be out here in a suit and tie no i mean if he's wearing skinny jeans and a tight shirt showing off his body then that's wrong because not because it's in style for people but because it's just as wrong for a man to show off his body just like it is for a woman to show off her body you see your clothes aren't wrong as long as they're not immodest and showing your body or have something on them that's sinful you see God's not concerned with your clothes. I mean, if you just got a shirt and a pair of jeans, if that's all you got, then that's all you got. But if a man is dressed decent and modest, I mean, you can't just judge a person by their out, uh, how they look outwardly. I don't I believe he's at liberty to wear what he wants when he preaches. I don't judge their me message by if they have a suit and tie on. Did you know that there are men today that would not listen to a preacher if he didn't have on a suit and a tie? Don't judge it by that. I judge it by how faithful are they to the book. This is righteous judgment. Is that man faithful to the book? Does he preach the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the message being preached, is it the right message? That's how you judge it. That's judging it by righteous judgment, not about how he's looking in his clothes. But when I'm teaching and, and people are kind of just looking at me and not saying anything, I don't just assume that they are spiritually dead just because they're just looking at me. I mean, they can just sit there and breathe for all I care. I mean, I'm just glad they showed up. I'm glad they showed up to the class to hear me. Think about it. If they didn't care, then why would they even be there? They could have slept in longer and not even showed up. Think about it. A man can get up and quietly say the greatest truth ever behind the pulpit. And if he just says it in his normal speaking voice, a lot of times you'll just hear crickets. A lot of times they'll just sit there and look at him. But if a man gets up and screams, I love fried chicken or something, everybody will say, amen. And it's like, I've noticed this over by listening. I listen to all types of preachers. I love all of them. The preachers that yell, the preachers that don't yell, the hacking preachers. I love all that. And I've noticed that if he gets real loud, then they get real loud. If he's quiet, then they'll most likely be more quiet. And he can say the greatest truth ever behind the pulpit, and you hear crickets, but then the other preacher can get up and say the exact same thing, and they all shout and say amen. And the, the misconception is the guy that's yelling is full of the Spirit, and the guy that's not yelling is not filled with the Spirit. That's not righteous judgment. He said the exact same thing from the same, the same Spirit, said the same thing in the quiet man as it did in the loud man. And if you're saying that a guy is filled with the Spirit just because he's yelling, that's not righteous judgment. Somebody who isn't cheering you on might be taking to heart what the pastor is saying even more than the charismatic guy in the crowd. The charismatic guy might have been so worried about cheering you on that he doesn't even remember what your message was about the next day. He was too busy fulfilling his duty to cheer you on. But the guy who was sitting quietly might remember your sermon title and how many times you preached it and what year you preached it and took notes on it and took note of it in his mind. It comes down to the fact that I can't see your heart and I'm not so focused on judging your heart by what I think you ought to be doing outwardly. What I think that I ought to be doing would be extreme for you and what you think I ought to be doing might be extreme for me. We all have different personalities. We all have different strengths. We all react to things differently. Stuff gets to us a different way. And we're all on different levels in our walk. You have to remember this. You can't judge people by what's going on outwardly so much. And I love all kinds of camp meeting style preaching. I'm not teaching against that at all. I'm not preaching against yelling preachers here. But they assume that since someone isn't walking across the pews 
are jumping up and screaming and hollering all the time that that person is not as spiritual as they are or that they're spiritually dead or they're not they're not excited that's crazy i mean i'm not one to get up and run around and shout and scream and holler but i'm more excited about the word of god than anything it's what i do from 4 a.m in the morning to the time i go to bed at night i'm doing something with the bible nothing excites me more than that when the bible believing crowd they'll many times they think the camp meeting style crowd is isn't as spiritual because they don't read the bible through as many times as they do and that's wrong just let people be what they are some people are quiet some people are loud some people people are just different people have different personalities you can't see their heart and John chapter 8, you have the famous chapter about the woman taken in adultery. And you got great verses in John eight twelve. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If you walk in the light, then you can see what needs to be cleaned up. If you walk in the dark, then you're blind and you're tripping over your own obstacles that your sin puts in the way. John eight thirty one. then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You see, many men start out reading the Bible every day, but they don't continue in the word. It gets old to them after a while, and they go back to Fortnite. They go back to NBA 2K. They go back to ESPN. They go back to hunting and fishing and hanging out with their friends and forsaking the Bible. John 8, 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Nothing sets you free like the truth. The people who believe all these lies of the devil and the lies of wicked men, they're walking around in handcuffs. But they see you as the one in handcuffs. It's like if you went to visit a prison and the inmates on the other side of the fence were looking at you and feeling sorry for you and telling you that you are in bondage and you need to live a little. That's what, it, that's what I think when I see a liberal or a wicked man who tells me how I'm not living up to his expectations. The prisoner thinks he's more free than the visitors and the security guards. In John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You see, not everyone is a child of God. Lost men are a child of the devil. Your father used to be the devil, but he's not anymore. He was a murderer and a liar. There is no truth in him, but the truth sets you free. He is roaming loose right now, but he's going to spend eternity in bondage. He has no truth, and bondage is in his future because the truth sets you free. He doesn't have it. John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man born blind. You were born blind, but you received sight when you were born again. John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is the chief shepherd. And uh, Bob Alexander pointed out how a pastor is not actually ever called a shepherd. And Jesus is the chief shepherd. And when we follow him, we act like good little sheep. When we get re rebellious, we follow the goat man, the devil. That's the devil. He's the one that is a thief and a robber. He is the one that kills, steals, and destroys. He tried to get through the door some other way. That is the door of the third heaven. He wanted to exalt himself above God above the stars of God and be like the Most High. We got to come through the door of the Lord Jesus Christ if we're going to go through that door of heaven. And, But yeah, Bob Alexander pointed out that it doesn't actually call the pastor a shepherd. But he said, uh, he, he said what he believes is the, the pastor is the sheepdog that go, runs after the sheep. I thought that was a good illustration. John chapter 11, the death and raising of Lazarus. And John eleven seventeen. 17, then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Then John eleven forty three 43 and 44, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. That is what he did for us at salvation. He separated us from death. My body will one day die one day, but the real me lives forever. At the rapture, he will do a similar thing. He's going to meet me in the air and call me out of this world. He'll say something like, Your name and come forth. John 12, the story about Martha and Mary is what you have here, but also... In John 12, 9 through 11, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because, they, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So they wanted to kill Lazarus because he was bringing glory to Jesus Christ just by being there. If you have men that hate you, want to kill you, or have wishful thinking of your death, then you might be giving Jesus the glory. <clears throat> John 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and Satan enters Judas. And John 13, 2, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You see, the devil can put things in your heart. That is why I don't trust my heart. I look to the scriptures first. I don't want to be tricked into operating by a feeling. In John 13, 8 and 9, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I always thought this was one of the funniest verses in the Bible. Peter is such a character. He's like a comic book relief in the scriptures he said okay lord wash not my feet only but also my hands and my head and john thirteen twenty three. now there was leaning on jesus bosom one of his disciples whom jesus loved now i don't want to lay my head on any man's bosom but jesus wasn't just another man he's he's god and john wrote this gospel knowing that jesus was god we know that jesus is god and and that he loved the other disciples too, but he had a special relationship with John. John 13, 23 and 24. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of the, his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. Once again, Peter doing something funny. Instead of asking the Lord himself, he wanted John to ask him. That's like when I was little and a friend would come over, I'd say, maybe if you ask they will let us go outside. And John thirteen twenty five through 27, he says, He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is, to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That that thou doest do quickly. So the devil himself went into Judas. Something even crazier than that. Jesus himself is in me. I'm closer to Jesus than John was. John laid down on Jesus' bosom. Jesus Christ lives in me. He goes where I go. Uh, little kids get an imaginary friend. That's just a counterfeit. I've got a friend that follows me everywhere I go, gives me advice from a book, and that's Jesus Christ. He's not imaginary. John thirteen thirty seven through 38. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. You see, Peter just won't ever shut up. And Jesus prophesies Peter's future denial of him. But Peter gives me hope because he messes up a lot and I mess up a lot. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 14, 6, he said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The thing about a Bible believer is that we believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father and that you can't get salvation any other way, not through Lord Shiva's or Krishna or Muhammad or Buddha or any other false god. It's only through the Lord Jesus. In John 15, he says, I am the true vine. And he talks about the world hating him. In John 16, you see the work of the Holy Spirit. In John 17, Jesus lifts up his eyes and prays, prays to God for the disciples.
He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth in John 17, 17. In John 18, you got the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. And in John 18, 1 through 2, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas betrayed. You put both of those words together, it's 13 letters. Chapter 18 is 3 times 6. Judas 18, 3 through 5. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Notice the Lord doesn't even try to get out of this because he knew that is why he came. He came to die for the sins of the whole world. John eighteen six. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Notice there is another I am. He said, I am he. And they all fall backwards. When someone worships God in the Bible, they fall forward on their face. Here, these enemies of God fall backwards. Benny Hinn supposedly makes people fall backwards with his fake powers. That ought to tell you something. John eighteen ten through 11. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, once again, is the star of the show. And this is why I believe that Peter was not actually afraid. You know, a lot of people think that Peter denies the Lord three times because he's afraid. But if that's so, then why did he pull out a sword and cut off one of those guys' ear? I mean, he was trying to start something here. He was uh, trying to defend the Lord, which was against the will of God. So the Lord puts the man's ear back on. Uh, then in John eighteen seventeen and 18... It says, Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. So a lot of people think that Peter's denying him because he's scared. And the servants and officers stood there who made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So I personally don't believe that he was afraid. I think he was mad at the Lord for not fighting. But this famous scripture here has been preached by many men over the years about how you shouldn't warm yourself by the world's fire like Peter. Now, John eighteen twenty five through 27. And Simon Peter stood out, stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. So just like Jesus said, he was Peter was so confident, but he denied him. And this reminds me that I don't need to get overconfident in myself, but to say, Lord willing, I won't ever do this or that. John eighteen thirty six, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. One day, real soon, his servants are going to fight, when he comes down on a white horse in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Now John eighteen thirty nine and 40, But ye have custom, that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So they released Barabbas instead of Jesus. Jesus was a just man. Barabbas was a wicked man. And Jesus is going to go to be crucified where Barabbas should have been going to be crucified. And this pictures me and you who are Barabbas going free when we should have been the ones crucified. And Jesus took our place. But in John 19, you have Jesus being delivered to be crucified. In verse 1, they scourge him. In verse 2 and 
In uh, 3, they put a crown of thorns on him and a purple robe, and they mock him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. In verse 3, they smite him with their hands. Pilate brings him forth and tells the people that he finds no fault in him. But the people yell, Crucify him. And they say he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. So they chose to crucify their king. In verse 17, he's bearing his cross as he goes to the place of the skull. In verse 18, two were crucified on both sides of him. And Pilate wrote a title on his cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And then Joseph of Arimathea lays, him, lays the body of Jesus in a new sepulcher after he dies on the cross. But then in John 20, you have the resurrection. In John 20, verses 6 through 9, Then cometh Simon Peter, Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher, and see it the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Jesus also appears to Mary Magdalene, and this is right before he goes up to the third heaven. And it's a picture of Jesus Christ appearing so that he can take out his bride at the rapture before he later comes back down again at the second coming. You see that? See, he appears to this woman first, Mary Magdalene, but he's going to go back up and then come back down later. That pictures him appearing to the bride at first, going back up, and then coming back down later at the second coming. John 20 and verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So he is actually going to go up to the Father here and come back down again to see the disciples. In John 20, verse 19, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So Jesus, in his glorified body, just walked through solid objects. The doors were shut, but Jesus came through and stood in the midst. And this was in the same day that he appeared to Mary Magdalene. So that showed that in his glorified body, he just teleports back and forth from the third heaven to the earth. Or he just goes much faster than the speed of light to get to the third heaven. So the disciples were meeting in the evening on the first day of the week there, and he just shows up in the meeting. Now, chapter 21, Jesus shows himself to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And here's a funny story. In John 21, 5 through 7, Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Now that's a funny story if you sit and think about it. Peter is in that boat naked. Why in the world was Peter naked on that boat? Peter is crazy. And when the Lord shows up, he jumps into the water. I really don't know what to think of this story, other than when I get to the judgment seat, I don't want to be found naked in front of the Lord. Peter didn't want to be found naked in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't either. I want to have something to sh to co as a covering. In 2 Corinthians 5, 2 and 3, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. The tribulation saints also, they don't want to be found naked before the Lord. Revelation sixteen fifteen. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You don't want to be found naked before the Lord. You want to have some works that you did for him. And John twenty one twenty five. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And I heard Bob Alexander talking about how this verse opened his eyes to the Bible. He said he was reading the Bible through like once a month. And he saw this verse one time when he was reading it. And he realized it's about every word. That it isn't about how many times you go through the Bible. 
but how much it goes through you. Because this verse made him realize something. And he pointed out that there was so much stuff that was written back then that wasn't included in the Bible, that the Lord didn't include in the Bible, and so much that the Lord that the Lord himself did that wasn't in the Bible. So much that the world couldn't contain the books that should be written. So what that showed him was that the Lord handpicked out of all the events and out of all the books, he handpicked what he wanted in this Bible to preserve to you. And that showed him how precious every word is. He hand-selected every word that we have today. So that shows that every single little word is important. And those stories and genealogies that are in there that you think are boring, those are so important. So now instead of going through the Bible once a month, he started to analyze every word. And it wasn't just about reading the Bible through once a month. It became about, what does this verse, what does this word mean? Uh, what does the Lord mean in here? And just really digging deep because... It's not about a number, how many times you can make it through it. It's how many times it's going to go through you. And, I mean, you could read the Bible through once a month. I mean, that's, that would be a good thing. But it's a little bit different to sit down and analyze every word. I think you need a good mixture of both. Read it a lot, study it a lot. But I went a little long on this one. It's just a great book. It's got a lot in it. The Gospel of John.